So thank you for coming to my talk uh, about MicroPython. And uh, before I get started, I have a few acknowledgments to give. Um, my friend Joe Fitzpatrick, who is securely Fitz, he has a hardware security business that happens to run out of my house. So um, all of the parts and the late nine phone calls of, um, I think the solder joints just popped off the FTDI cable I was using. Do you have anything else I could use? Uh, went answered by this fellow, and this uh, presentation would not have been possible without him. Um, MicroPython.org, of course, has been a really excellent resource, and like. Just like software, um, I have stolen most of this. Um, and from countless GitHubs and blogs that I've um, cited along the way as appropriate, these two in particular, um, in particular the uh, Game of Life one, were super lifesavers in getting together everything I needed for this project. OK, so first of all, what is MicroPython? Um, that's the little MicroPython official assembly doodad up there in the corner. So this is going to be multiple choice. Um, like regular Python, but small and hard to read. A version of Python optimized for use on microcontrollers. Funded via Kickstarter. All of the above, or some of the above. Standardized tests are really great, aren't they? It's E, some of the above. As it turns out, it is not small and hard to read, thankfully. Um, it was funded via Kickstarter, which is really fascinating to me anyway, that um, we now have firmware and we can run Python on tiny little hardware things, uh, thanks to a Kickstarter thing. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, and so uh, I first heard about MicroPython this year at PyCon, and I thought it sounded super rad. I used to play with microcontrollers when I was in college, which was like a really, really, really long time ago, and I forgot everything that would have been relevant to doing this project. So um, I'm hoping that sharing my experience of floundering through getting all this up and running would be helpful to other people that are maybe kind of intimidated by hardware or like might be interested in trying it out for themselves. MicroPython.org. Okay, so some things about the hardware. It's a little distracting here. It's hard. Um, it is really hard. Like there are so many things that could possibly go wrong. I've spent two hours sitting in the back of this room today trying to program up one of three other microcontrollers that I have with me that are of the same type to run a second internet of cats so I could like maybe pass something around. And it wouldn't work. Um, even using all of the instructions that I made for myself, uh, it's just really tricky and I'm very thankful that this thing is still working by the grace of God. <laughs> um, micro fractures are a real pain. So if you don't know what that is, these little jumper wires that you can get to kind of wire between little things or wire from your cable to your board, um, they break inside sometimes. And I've spent hours debugging things and going, oh, the driver for this board must be wrong, or maybe this board is slightly different, so I'm going to get into the C code and see what's going on. It, it was a broken wire. Um, so wires are hard. Also, it does cost money. This was a very cheap project to put on, for one thing, because I was given the hardware for free. But I'm going to show you the cost of the components in the next slide. Um, but unlike just writing software, it's not something that you can just pull up on your laptop, you actually have to be able to go and acquire parts to do this. Um, may result in hair loss. Um, may also re result in delighted squeals. Um, one of the cats that's not really a cat on here is Totoro, and I just put Totoro uh, like in the, the cat library, if you will, on the, um, the server that's running here last night, and my partner heard me squeal with joy when I saw Totoro's face pop up here. So it's really awesome. Um, this is something you're going to really want to have. It's called a multimeter. Um, you can get one for $15. Whenever you're playing with hardware, it's imperative that you have some way to make sure that the signals, the power levels and stuff that you expect to be going in and out are um, what you would expect. Um, one way to know is if the voltage you're supplying is too high, you will smell burning things. Um, but short of smelling burning things, a, um, a multimeter is going to be your best friend. Um, another thing is here in Portland, we have a friendly neighborhood hackerspace called Control H. Um, they did a really cool uh, art project called the Internet of Buckets. I would encourage you to look that up. Um, and that was a art installation they had up at Tor Camp, and I think they have over at the hackerspace. But there's a lot of people there that would love to help you, and of course they have like equipment and stuff that you can use to hack with. So um, about the Internet of Cats. So uh, this is the thing that I've been working on for like the last two months, and it serves up these like one-bit cat pictures and just wanted to kind of step through the components that I'm using. So I'm using the ESP8266, which is a Wi-Fi module microcontroller. 
kind of popular right now. I think Hackaday just had a competition on, you know, show us all the cool things you can do with an ESP8266, which is uh, where that Game of Life game came from. And then the display I'm using is the Nokia 5110. It wasn't used in Nokia phones, as you might guess by the name. And it's a um, 84 pixel wide by 48 pixel high um, monochrome display. And then I put them together and voila, the internet of cats. So um, basically I have a web server running on the ESP8266. I also have some uh, algorithms on board to deal with requests for different types of pictures. And I have um, bitmapped pictures of cats also sitting on the board, which it then reads out based on the request that you send it. And I'll be talking through all of that. Um, and then this is the web version of it is you can go and uh, query if you could see here. You go over to the board um, that is you're serving internet from and say, I want the Pusheen cat. And then you get Pusheen. So um, that's the internet of cats overview. Okay, material costs. So ESP8266 are really cheap. Depending on where you're getting from, it'd be two to six dollars. The LCD is about three bucks. Um, a multimeter from Sparkfun will run you about fifteen dollars. You could probably get one cheaper. Um, and the serial cable that I use to talk to the board is anywhere from two to ten dollars. Jumper wires, which are those little things that like to break, um, those are, you can get all set up uh, for six dollars easily. And so the cost all together is about thirty to forty dollars, um, including a multimeter to kind of get up and run something like this. You should probably also have a breadboard. I just realized I didn't put that in, in here, but that would be really helpful too. So about the ESP8266, it has a 3.3 volt supply. This is really important because there's a lot of things like in the Arduino family that run on five volts. So please keep that in mind if you're gonna be using this and interfacing it with other microcontrollers that it runs at a lower supply than some. Um, it may require extra current than your USB port can deliver in um, kind of debugging my own problems and reading through forums. Uh, some people have been successful um, running the ESP8266 through a USB um, connection, some have not. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, you're limited to about 25 kilobytes of um, uh, heap RAM. So when you're actually in the terminal and writing your programs and running something on there, you have to be really judicious about how you're using your memory. And I'm gonna talk through um, the techniques that I'm using to display the pictures that are kind of as a result of not being able to pull them all into memory at once. Um, and that there are many configurations of this particular microcontroller. For instance, my friend Joe gave me this one and I'm like, sweet, that looks really great. It's an ESP8266. I didn't know it was a specific model number, so when I ordered one from Sparkfront and I got this in the mail, I was like, wait, something is different. Um, this one's a four pin one as opposed to the like 12 or 14 pin one. So be aware that there's a lot of configurations. There's actually a uh, wiki, ESP8266.com, that goes through the numerous um, configurations of this microcontroller. Okay, um, so people have been asking me what kind of hardware can I use with MicroPython? Like I wanna do this MicroPython thing, it only runs on a certain number of boards right now. So um, I just figured this out myself the other day putting this presentation together, but if you go through the documentation site, there's this little thing down here on the lower left that says um, ports and versions, and if you click on that, it'll expand up and you, there we go. It expands up and it'll show you that, um, like for instance, these are the ports, the Pi board, YPi, 8266. Um, there are others that are not listed here, but this would be a good starting place if you were wondering what boards you can use for MicroPython. And so, if we have, let's say we get a, a target, so in this case the target is the ESP8266, it's just a name for what chip you're programming. Um, and now I want to teach it to speak MicroPython. So the first thing you want to do is get some firmware for the board. Um, I found, I wanted to call this out specifically because when I was going through the tutorial, they just said, follow the directions to get the firmware. And the direction said, get the firmware. They didn't really link to anything, even though it was on the same site. So if you get to that step and you're like, where is the firmware? It's, it sends you to GitHub, where it tells you to download and compile it for yourself, which you can do, but I'd pulled out enough hair at that point and the pre-compiled binary worked for be just fine. So um, that's where you would get it. And then there is a special little tool called ESP tool that you can get via pip that will actually program this um, firmware down into the board for you. And <clears throat> So 
this is just a uh, schematic of how you would set up the board. In particular, this board is able to be programmed, um, set up for flashing or not flashing via this tiny little button right here. Um, I wanted to point out in particular that for flashing, this connection is very important, that when you're flashing, this would be shorted and GPIO 15 and zero are grounded. And also, chip enable has to be high whenever you're interacting with the chip. But this was um, kind of a subject of mystery for me that I had to do a lot of Googling about and reading a lot of different people's experience to figure this out, and maybe that's obvious to people who've done this before, but that would not be me. So, um, flashing the board. So here are some commands that you would use to both erase the flash here with the ESP tool, and then you'd use this ESP tool again to write. Um, and what I found out is, it just kind of shows you this in sequence on the MicroPython documentation, but I would always get this fatal error occurred, could not connect. So I tried turning it on and off again, so I erased the flash, I pulled it out, I put it back in, and then I was able to write the flash. So just FYI on that. Okay, so we're going to talk about the REPL, which is read, evaluate, print loop. It's just a command line shell. That's, that's all that really means. And this is once you have MicroPython on the board, this is what you will interact with. So um, you can use something like uh, Screen or Minicom or Picocom to um, connect to the board via whatever uh, USB um, it's mounted on. And then noting the baud rate there is 115200. And then you'll get a screen that hopefully won't be quite as blurry as this one, but it'll say, hey, it's MicroPython time. And then you can do things like write Python on this tiny little thing. It's really exciting, at least I think so. Um, another really cool thing about MicroPython is this thing called the web REPL. So you can connect your board to either as an access point itself or even to like your home internet or I could have connected it to the internet here. Um, and instead of having to connect to the board via wire, you can connect over a browser connection. So I can, I'm gonna try and show that to you here. So right now, uh oh, it disconnected me. Oh, that's right. Um, I'm on the guest Wi-Fi. If I switch over, this is my little micro Python board. So I'm gonna switch over to that. And let's see, let me just refresh the screen. See if it'll let me connect. So the first time you come through here, it asks you to set a password. I've already done that. All right, so now we're, this is actually interacting with the board. So like print, no, it's not typing. Sad. Oh God, I don't even know how to, I don't know how to do that, but this is not, thank you. I'm more worried that I'm typing and nothing's happening. Let me see. Okay, let me see. Oh, it won't let me print. Something is strange. Okay, well, anyway, back to the presentation. I will come back later and see what's going on with this. Um, maybe I need to turn it on and off again, probably. So it looks like this, and you can then, like this was, um, for me, I was running this HTTP server to serve up the cats. Um, so I ran the command to set up the, um, to get the server running, and then it says, you know, I'm listening to things going on here. So you can write Python from here. Um, this is also a really awesome way to send and receive files from the device. So all of the cat files that I needed, I sent over to the device this way, as well as all the Python files that I wrote for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some tips. Um, I'm gonna talk about the boot pie a little bit later, but basically this is a Python file that will be read on startup by the board. And I found it really helpful to enable web, the web REPL immediately, so if there's something happening, um, you can debug over an internet connection. And for me, like because I was having kind of flaky cable issues, this was really a lifesaver. Um, the thing is, I've also noticed uh, it would sometimes not be able to run along with the rest of my code because of the memory constraints, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, and make sure you can see the Wi-Fi network. I had a problem with the Chromebook that I was using for development that it, for some reason it couldn't see the MicroPython network. And I'm sure not, I'm still not sure why that was happening, but it made me think that it was not actually working. So um, if you have another computer or check with your phone, if you can see it, that would be probably really helpful. So, 
I was mentioning about the memory issue. Uh, garbage collection is really important as you're working uh, with this device because, it, like I said, it's very memory constrained. So this is just uh, kind of the header from my, I think it was the boot pi file or possibly the, the LCD setup file. But at any rate, it's like I'm importing a few things, collecting garbage, and then as I'm importing some other things, I just continue to do garbage collection. So it's important to clean up after yourself in a memory constrained environment like that. Okay, um, this is just to, for my, kind of for reference if you wanted to come back and look at this later, but these are the pinouts um, for connecting the Nokia display to the ESP8266. So this basically is that these are the command um, pins that you're gonna connect up to the LCD so that you can talk to it and send image data over to it. Um, and here we are for setting up the uh, LCD. So it communicates over a SPI interface. Basically, um, what I'm doing here is just setting up the pins and that sort of thing to talk to this, the display. So like the backlight on the uh, LCD is pin 16, the chip enable is pin five, um, and then I am sending all of these things uh, to the driver for the 8266, which is actually an 8544 driver. This is, um, I think in my notes, uh, also in part of this presentation, this is the driver that is used to drive this Nokia um, display. And then setting up, basically telling it what the display uh, like size is, more or less, and creating these um, frame buffer objects where we're going to be interacting with the display via byte arrays. And I'll get more into that in a minute. So writing to the LCD. Um, there's a couple of different things that you can do with the LCD. Um, you can clear the display, and that's basically filling the frame buffer with zeros. Um, you can draw a pixel, giving it a X and Y. Um, that third parameter is color, but in the case of this display, it's black, it's basically on or off, so you'd give it a one to turn it on. You can also write text via the frame buffer interface, so you can tell it this is the text that I want, and this is the uh, X and Y coordinate. Um, the color I think you can also, you might be able to omit. Um, and then to send that down to the device, you would use this LCD object, but if I went back to the previous slide, so this is our display object, you can then use that to send down the buffer and going and using these frame buffer commands writes this information into the buffer object which we then send down to the LCD. That's how the cats happen. Like that. So here I um, sent down a cat to the board and I also wrote my name and internet of cats using these various commands. Okay, so let's get some cats. Now that I've kind of given you uh, some of the technical background of how to set up the board and whatnot. Um, so how do we draw a cat on a 48 by 84 pixel monochrome screen. I'm glad you asked. First, let's find a cat. So when you're looking for a cat, um, you want one that converts easily to black and white, a cat picture, I mean. Um, you also want something that's going to look good within the uh, constraints of the size that we're working with. And something generally that's not super detailed, so the less detailed the cat is, the better off you are with this device. So let's take, for example, this Hello Kitty picture um, as our candidate for sending down to the device. So I'm gonna use image magic on the command line, um, which is something that I also fooled around with in college and wanted to kill myself about, but somehow I figured out how to make it work this time, which is great because you can do things like, you're an image magic fan out here. Yes, okay, great. Um, I'm kind of almost afraid of, of image magic as I am of BI. So getting our cat onto a white background um, using the convert command, we're gonna take our Hello Kitty PNG, and we have it a background white, we're gonna do this alpha thing, which I don't understand, and then we're gonna get a kitty with a white background. And then we are going to scale the cat. We need to make the cat small so it goes on the microcontroller, because the microcontroller is also small. And so we can just use the resize command to give us our small, actually, Hello Kitty, it should be down here, not small, cat paws. Okay, and so that is our teeny little Hello Kitty that has the white background. It's enlarged to show texture. It's not actually 48 by 48 there. And then there's a Python um, conversion script, which I um, also stole 
uh, from this GitHub that will convert that into a byte array. And so you can see there's Hello Kitty. Um, so this is the text file that I send over to the ESP8266 that it creates cat photos from. Um, not photos, pictures. So image drawing, um, this is just for reference, that's the name of the Python file if you were in my GitHub repo. So I'm going through and drawing the image line by line. Initially, I tried to read the entire image array into memory and write it out to the device, and I found out that I was running out of memory. So I resorted to kind of going through every line, and then kind of, this is sort of exploded to show the procedure. And for each character, um, in my case, I had flipped the bitmap so that if it was zero, I was going to write the pixel down and collect the garbage. And then at the end of each, uh, once I've processed all the lines, oh, my indentation is off here, very sorry. Um, I'm gonna send that data down to the buffer and that's how we're going to write out the image. And collect the garbage again, because we need to clean up after ourselves. Um, and this is uh, for reference the various ways that I talked about um, working with the frame buffer. It was from uh, this GitHub repo and you can see there's a few other, um, like for scrolling, there's different ways that you can interact with the frame buffer, so this is pretty much just for reference. Okay, so let's draw a cat. Um, so all that stuff that I showed you around pulling in the driver and creating the LCD object, um, that is all part of a um, setup lcd.python script that I sent over to the board. So I'm gonna import everything from there. And then our image drawing routines are in this other module that I'm importing from. And then I can say I want to draw Hello Kitty and I want, I'm going to send it the various um, LCD and display related objects that it needs to actually do the drawing, and then something like this happens. So, um, enabling drawing on boot via boot.py. So, like I had mentioned, um, if you want the, if you know what you want the device to do and you're not just playing with it, the boot.py thing is really cool because you can just put all of your code references in there and then as soon as the thing powers up, it'll start doing the stuff. So this is what my boot.py looks like. Um, so I'm setting up, go back, thank you. Um, setting up the LCD and the image, and I'm importing web REPL at the end. I actually tried importing this at the beginning and I had memory errors, so for whatever reason, switching the order of these things seemed to be more amenable to what I was doing before. Um, and I noticed that when I was using the boot.py, Sometimes when I would try and load in other modules after boot or like when I logged in after it had booted up, I would see this um, specific error uh, that I thought meant that there was something wrong. You know, it says, it said this line 27 in your Python file. So I would go and be like, well, there's nothing wrong there. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, and this was something that was, again, solved by turning it on and off again. And now the internet. So. I've shown you how to set up all this hardware, how to process cat pictures, how to put the cat pictures on the board, and how to display the cat pictures. Thank you. And now I'm gonna show you how to connect it to the internet. Okay, so we are going to set up an HTTP server to um, serve up our cats and enable control of the LCD from the internet star as long are you, as you are logged into the internet that this little guy provides or if the ESP8266 itself is connected to the internet. And I created a HTTP server file that was very closely based on the MicroPython example. So now we're gonna process the cat request. So I don't really know anything at all about sockets or HTTP programming, but from what I was able to glean from this example, I had to get like the request from the client, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm gonna read the stream from the client I'm gonna convert it to a string. I'm gonna print it out so I can do some diagnostics. And I'm gonna say, okay, if in my request I find that somebody has requested the uh, sitting cat, I'm going to say, okay, this is the text file that I'm then going to show, and I'm going to draw the image, LCD cat, which is the sitting cat. Um, I can has demo, I don't know. I, we have five minutes. Let me finish this and then we can take questions. And if not, um, so let's say we went to this web address and we asked for Totoro, which again is, he's not really a cat, but then Totoro shows up. And he's technically not a cat, but um, I really like Totoro, and the cat bus would not fit on um, this resolution, so that's as close as I could get. 
Um, so that's how it works. You would go to this web address and you would say cat equals like Hello Kitty or Pusheen or um, the MicroPython logo, which is also not a cat, it's a snake. Um, so it's like the internet of cats and friends. And so this is currently the selection of cats and friends that are available on the internet of cats. Um, if you would like to add more cats to the internet of cats, you can please uh, send me a pull request. Be happy to um, add more to our kitty and friends family. Um, and some notable mentions, just wrapping up here. Um, check your wires. A multimeter is your friend. It will save you a lot of time if you can do that before assuming that something really horrible has happened. Steal liberally, but attribute. And try a development board. So I wanted to see if I could do something that was cheap enough that possibly I could you know, make, um, make it into a quasi mass produced thing like a conference badge or something and people could log into their badge and display different stuff and that would be really cool. So I wanted to get the bare components, but it actually ended up being a real pain for me because I had to deal with a lot of stuff as someone pretty new to this. Whereas if you got something like the Pi board, which is actually designed for MicroPython or um, the Adafruit Huzzah board for the AE266, those come set up with a lot of nice bells and whistles so you won't run into probably a lot of the problems that I did. Um, and have you tried turning it on and off again? has kind of been like the way that I've got myself through this. So um, thank you. Uh, this is the GitHub repo for this project. I'm, it's just kind of a bunch of code right now, but I do want to make it like nicer and actually have instructions and suggestions and stuff. So watch that space for more. If you'd like to get in touch with me, I am on Twitter at giz0 zero underscore uh, zero or sev at the data scout. So I will uh, take your questions. Thank you.